Well, hello, everyone. It is such a great day for FISMA Friday, and I'm so glad to be here with you all. Now, today we are going to be diving into the latest updates into the Preventative Controls for Human Foods rule, what it all means, and how you can best prepare. There is a lot to get to, but we have so many newcomers on the show today, so I have to tell you about FISMA Friday. Where did it come from? We've been doing this for many, many, many years in a partnership with the Atchison Group and safety chain. Uh, this is our chance to kind of share a little bit of our knowledge and insights around what the latest FISMA updates are, give you best practices and actionable uh, approaches that you can start using today to help in your food safety efforts. Now, just a few housekeeping items. We've muted everybody's mic, but we are leaving room at the end for some Q&A. Please, throughout the presentation, do enter your questions into the question panel. We will get to them. We have time set aside for that. Now, if we do happen to run out of time, do not worry. We will absolutely follow up with your individual questions after the webinar. And for those of you who would like to share the recording, we're going to send it to you later today, just about a couple hours after the event. Please check your inboxes. We'll have the recording and the webinar slides available to you, as well as some additional resources that you can also review and uh, get back to us with any questions. So, all right, with that out of the way, let's get to it. I am super excited to welcome back to the show, Dr. Ruth Petram. She has extensive experience in microbiology, food safety, quality assurance, and she's worked for big, big companies like Pillsbury and General Mills and Ecolab, where she was the vice president of food safety and public health. So Ruth, I gotta say, your last FISMA Friday presentation around the safety risks within our global food trends was absolutely one of our more popular ones last year. So we really appreciate you coming back and sharing a little insight around the changes on that PCHF rule. Thank you. I am thrilled to be back and uh, I welcome you all who have joined us online for this webinar and um, it's a it's a pretty significant topic, so thank you for joining us, and thanks um, to the organizers for bringing me back. I appreciate it. Well, we're glad you're here, Ruth. All right, let's see what we got today. All right, let's jump into this. All right. So topics that we're going to cover. Um, I am going to touch on a couple recent regulatory developments aside from this newly revised guidance. Um, but then we're really going to jump into what this guidance says uh, and more specifically how to use it. Uh, I think there's some great insights here that uh, are going to help us all um, produce safer food. So first of all, as far as kind of other news in the regulatory world, I did see that there was an announcement recently that the USDA has intended to review the, or sorry, renew the committee um, for the National Advisory Committee on the Microbiological Criteria for Food, or NACMIF, and its charter. Um, if you're not familiar with NACMIF, um, they've been very instrumental through the years in developing positions related to kind of nagging public health issues. It's a discretionary advisory committee that's been around since the late 80s. Um, kind of jointly uh, providing advice to both the USDA as well as the US Department of Health and Human Services. So the FDA, CDC side of the side of the fence as well. And in the past, they've uh, provided advice on say the development of microbiological criteria, reviewing, evaluating epidemiological risk ass assessment data and various methodologies as well. So. Anything that comes out of NACMIF um, is always helpful information, and I'm really excited to see that uh, it will be continuing to do its work. Switching gears, there was another uh, recent notice from FDA, kind of on the on the drug side, but it, it is interesting to think about. They've approved um, a new use of a medication that can help to reduce allergenic reactions to folks who are sensitive to a variety of food types. Um, it's basically a new use for a drug that's been around and has been used for asthma patients in the past. Uh, it's an injection that's 
designed to be used for repeated use to reduce al allergic reactions, including risks of anaphylaxis um, that could occur among sensitive consumers after their exposure to various foods. A couple things to note, this is definitely not a cure for food allergies, and there must be continued avoidance among allergenic consumers. But um, this does, um, I think, bode well for these um, populations, and I think that's an exciting development. Hmm. But let's definitely. jump into the meat of what we're going to talk about today. So what I want to present is information about guidance that FDA has published, and it's certainly, as, as Jay described at the top of the hour, um, related to the preventive controls for human foods rule, which has been around for a while. The expectations are outlined on this slide. We all need to comply with GMPs. There needs to be a food safety plan. Records are required and a supply chain is required as well. And as I stated, these are not new requirements. This has been around um, since 2015. And obviously there's been staggered compliance dates based on size of operation. But basically the industry, manufacturing industry that is, has had to comply um, for many, many years. So um, I hope you all are. And as we all know, the required elements of this food safety plan um, include a hazard analysis, preventive controls, supply chain programs, if, if appropriate, a recall plan, if there are any identified hazards, um, various parameters for the monitoring and related to corrective actions to make sure these preventive controls are implemented, and then verification as well. And there's some relevant definitions to keep in mind as we kind of jump into this, um, that of hazard. And it's worthwhile to keep these in mind because a hazard is really any biological, chemical, or physical agent that has the potential to cause illness or injury. And obviously that, that's a large landscape of types of agents that could uh, cause these impacts. We apply this through a process called hazard analysis whose definition is shown. And basically it's this process of collecting and evaluating information about these hazards and what might lead to their presence to determine which of those are significant enough for food safety and need to be addressed either in a HACCP or a food safety plan. Again, definitions we all should know, but it's important to keep these in mind. Hazard analysis steps that we all should be familiar with as well is shown here. Um, first, considering what raw materials or ingredients are being used, what process steps are being followed, and at each of these or within each of these to identify those potential food safety hazards uh, and then evaluating them to determine if they need a preventive control, that is their significance justifying the decision and then identifying those preventive controls. So really, it all starts with hazard analysis and that's what this guidance uh, addresses. And I will give a disclaimer that obviously I'm not employed by FDA. Um, I am not speaking on their behalf. Um, this is based on my interpretation of this guidance, obviously with a lot of insights from others, but um, we need to think about and draw the line between it as far as advice that FDA might give and, and what a non-FDA person would give. But um, we do know that this hazard analysis is so crucial. It has to be accurate, it has to be complete, and it has to not miss any hazards because the risk is if you do, food safety may be compromised. Um, the good news is that we're not sitting on a dock by ourselves. Um, we have help from others that can assist us in this process to drive home the point of having an accurate hazard analysis. And a lot of this help has come, frankly, from the FDA itself as many, many guidance documents have been published. 
There's many reasons for these. Essentially, it's to inform us all about the regulation, to allow us to better understand what's required. Um, FDA would say that these do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities, but they do describe what FDA's current thinking is. Um, and they really, though, should be viewed as recommendations unless they specifically cite uh, regulatory or statutory uh, requirements, which they do in some of this guidance. And I highlight this um, information as well, because if you are not familiar with these guidance documents, you can become very familiar by subscribing to get email updates from the FDA. Um, there's a URL shown on the slide and just subscribing to get these in real time is a really helpful way to ensure that you are informed when these kinds of helpful materials are published. So what happened recently? Well, as is shown on the left-hand side of the slide, this is the a screenshot of the first page of this guidance. This was newly published last month and on the right side is a listing of the table of contents. You'll see um, many, many chapters here, some of which have been completed, some of which have not and are still in progress. So there will be continual updates to this information, which is um, what we can expect. Um, but notice as well, there are a couple of appendices as part of this guidance. And probably the, the biggest thing we have focused on is in this revised guidance is this new, newly revised Appendix 1, um, this listing of known or reasonably foreseeable hazards or potential hazards. So what does this Appendix 1 do? First of all, it lists um, many potential biological and chemical hazards for about 16 different food types. It also, in Appendix 1, clarifies the importance of considering process-related hazards, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but I think this um, starting list is a really good starting point, really. Um, to get you thinking about what are the potential hazards in these various food types. And you can most likely find your favorite food type among all of these and, and use this as um, your initial identification of hazards. So I want to talk through how we apply all of this information to the hazard analysis process, which again is that process of identifying and evaluating these hazards. So really referencing various parts of this guidance is, is what you all need to be doing, I think. First, starting with ingredients and to identify the potential hazards that might be related to those particular ingredients, what's inherent in those kinds of foods. Appendix one, table one, gives you a listing of possible biological hazards that might be associated with these various foods. Table two in appendix one tells you about the chemical hazards that might be associated with these food types. Information in chapters two and three of the guidance, which has been part of this guidance for quite a while, but has had some additions here and there, tells you about process-related hazards and helps you consider some of those, as well as giving you more information about some of what's described in Appendix 1. Um, using this, you can identify those potential process-related hazards that might occur at your supplier, as well as within your own manufacturing facilities. So let's talk about how we use this guidance and how to do it. So I'm going to start with a deeper dive into Appendix 1, 
Again, this listing of known or reasonably foreseeable hazards, but which um, we've seen in the past, um, we've seen these various tables of particular kinds of food commodities. The format is generally the same with some exceptions, but what's been added in this version of Appendix 1 is many, many pages before you get to the tables of background information. And it's very important, I think, to read through that and understand the basis for FDA's updates to these, what their current thinking is, and the like. Um, so reviewing that information is um, certainly what I would recommend. But what we all are probably most familiar with using Appendix 1 for is these tables. And I have a few different screenshots of some of these just to highlight a few different things. First of all, here is an example of a table uh, for the biological hazards in bakery items. So it's one of the table ones um, for one of these 16 different food categories. And a couple of things just to highlight, we continue to see um, quite a breadth of various food types, even within this category of bakery items. Um, we see various subcategories that are represented, various storage conditions shown here, examples of refrigerated, frozen, and ambient stored kinds of products, um, and a listing of the hazards, biological hazards, across the column headings. Um, some of these have changed. Some we see that the parasites and viruses, for example, are um, more generalized. Um, there has been some update here and there to the various hazard uh, identifications for each different kind of, of food category. So I would recommend if you have used this in the past for your uh, identifying of hazards, such take another look and just see if there's anything that has changed. So here's an example of one of the table twos related to chemical hazards. And we see here, uh, again, a variety of food types, storage conditions, um, and then the various chemical hazards that have been identified. And you'll notice that this list is shortened from what it was before um, to some extent, but um, notice that the heavy metals are broken out now and they specifically call out arsenic, cadmium, and lead. Okay, so again, an uh, another, um, advice from me would be to, if you have used these table twos for some of your identification of chemical hazards in your food types, go back and, and just verify um, what the most current information shows. Now there's one caveat related to these table twos related to chemical hazards in these food types in that some categories don't have a table two. Um, for a few different um, categories, and that includes bakery items, um, dressings and condiments and dips, snack foods, and soups and sauces. Because um, in general, the chemical hazards that would be associated with those kinds of products are related to the ingredients in those products. So bakery items being one of those as an example, um, in general, the guidance suggests that you might wanna consider in the ingredients within those bakery items, which could be chocolate or eggs or wheat flour or fruit in those particular bakery items uh, and consider the hazards that would be associated with them. And that's an example of some of this further explanation that FDA has provided that I think can be very helpful in allowing you to hone in on what's gonna be most uh, relevant to you. So that means that you would wanna use the particular tables related to say chocolate or eggs um, or wheat flour um, as you consider what hazards to identify in the product. 
So if we apply this to, for example, a baked chocolate croissant, and I just Googled an ingredient list for one of these, and this is what came up again. This is probably not what how all uh, chocolate croissant labels look like, but is an example. So we see here, um, obviously, the different ingredients that would be included within these chocolate croissants. And we see wheat flour and chocolate um, and eggs listed uh, in this ingredient deck. So what the guidance would suggest is that because you're not going to find a list of chemical hazards related to baked chocolate croissant in particular, but you would related to flour and chocolate and eggs. And you would need to go to those table to separately consider those ingredients to determine what potential hazards you might need to identify. I hope that makes sense. And another example of this is for so-called multi-component foods. Now you may recall in the previous version of Appendix 1, there was this category called multi-component foods and it was quite a large um, group of products, things like sandwiches and entrees and the like, um, things with many, many different kinds of ingredients. And I just did my same Google search for a typical frozen entree, um, a vegetable-based pasta kind of product. Um, and this is a typical ingredient deck. Um, so you're not going to find uh, information about frozen entrees any longer as a category called frozen entrees in the Appendix 1 guidance, but you are going to find information about all of the ingredients within this kind of food. So as I'm just kind of eyeballing here, we think about the milk, the pasta, I see vegetables, I see cheeses, um, you know, et cetera, there's some wheat flour down the list, at, you know, spices, et cetera. One would need to think about what are the inherent risks with those particular ingredients when you're thinking about the overall ingredient profile of this particular kind of food. I hope that makes sense. So it's really increased the focus on looking at the ingredients that might be within your particular foods. So remember I mentioned the utility of chapters two and three also within this guidance. Again, these have been part of the guidance for um, quite a while, but there's um, really helpful information that I think we all need to be aware of. Um, first of all, chapter two goes into how you do a hazard analysis and um, provides a lot of really good recommendations on how to do this step-by-step -step approach um, for both identification of hazards and evaluation as well. And there are some considerations related to the biological, chemical, and physical hazards that are of common concern in food plants and therefore would need to be addressed. And we'll talk through that in a little bit as well. Likewise, chapter three um, has been revised some, but continues to address those ingredient related hazards, calls out the specifics of process related in hazards, process related hazards, and those that could have been introduced from the pro food production environment or those that are facility uh, related, and provides really good background information about how you should be thinking about these and considering these. So a repeat slide here, remember we talked about looking at these ingredient related hazards and I showed you some examples of appendix ones, tables one and two that can be helpful and then the need to really focus in, in on ingredients within your products. Um, Chapters two and three um, really help you apply this same kind of logic to process related hazards that could be at your suppliers of these various ingredients, as well as within your own manufacturing facilities. And what the guidance does is lays out 
a variety of process related hazards in three different categories biological chemical and physical hazards which again are those that we should be aware of and i want to just review some of these to give you some flavor of how you ought to be thinking about these again thinking about these both at your suppliers facilities and within your own manufacturing facilities as well and they outline in the guidance several of these different process related hazards here we're going to go through some of those in the biological category first of all those that might be related to a, the presence growth and toxin production due to the survival of a heat treatment and as an example and there's many many of these we might think about the potential for listeria monocytogenes that might survive in milk if it were not pasteurized properly um, at the dairy who might supply you that milk as an ingredient okay um, again just something to consider Another category of process related biological hazards could be due to poor temperature control that allows for growth and or toxin production. And here we think about things like spore forming organisms like Clostridium perfringens in say a gravy product that might not be cooled uh, appropriately and might allow proliferation of C perfringens that can then produce a toxin or something like Staph aureus and its ability to produce toxin in maybe a batter system that could be exposed to warm temperatures too long um, and allow for potential growth of Staph aureus to high levels where Staph could be, or sorry, where toxin could be produced. Another kind of process related hazard might be due to poor formulation control again allowing for growth or toxin production um, an example if for example a acidified vegetable did not achieve its ph that was specified uh, vegetative cells of something like salmonella could outgrow and then uh, the potential for reduced oxygen packaging to allow for growth or toxin production uh, an example could be Clostridium botulinum toxin production, say in a vacuum packaged pasta that wasn't uh, considered uh, appropriately enough. There are a few other uh, process related biological types of hazards. For example, those that might be uh, related to ingredients that could be added after a process control or say a heat inactivation step has been implemented and we think about say salmonella that might um, be related to cocoa that might be used as a dusting on a baked uh, cake for example or seasonings that might be added to say a cracker after its baking step those might that might be related to recontamination due to a lack of container integrity and if we think here of say a ready to eat food that's pasteurized in a jar and then submerged in cooling water uh, to cool it down and if pathogens are in the cooling water they could be drawn in to that jar if uh, its integrity was not maintained and then we have uh, a continuing risk of a biological hazard from environmental pathogens due to recontamination from the processing environment. And here we think about our old friends Salmonella and Listeria uh, in a food that might be exposed to the environment after the lethality step, um, for example, a baked good after the oven. Uh, so these are chemical related hazards that might be related to the process that are now more specifically called out in the guidance. One is that, uh, or the first two are related to allergen hazards. And there's two different buckets of these where you have undeclared food allergens due to incorrect labeling, which could, for example, result from a printing error in the verbiage that's on the label or placing the wrong label on the package or an unintended food allergen presence related to cross contact, such as residual allergen soil that could be left on shared equipment if cleaning was not done 
uh, sufficiently. So these need to be considered within that process, either at the supplier or in your own hands as well. Other chemical hazards related to misformulation. For example, adding sulfite to a product that's not supposed to have sulfite, or if you over add an ingredient that has some maximal, maximum use level like niacin. A new addition to the chemical related by a lot, sorry, chemical related process hazard section are those that might be related to certain plant foods and they specifically call out an example of acrylamide formation in certain plant-based foods such as potato chips. So you might wanna take a look at this if you are producing some of these. And then the final category of process related hazards obviously is, is in the bucket of physical hazards. And they specifically call out these three, uh, metal, glass, and hard plastic. Um, these examples are fairly obvious. You know, if we have a process with a metal chopping blade, for example, uh, metal fragments could be introduced. Uh, glass related to a product that might be packaged in a glass container and then hard plastic from say wear of an equipment guard, utensils, et cetera. So again, the guidance details that you need to consider these process kinds of related hazards and specifically calls out these categories. But I think it's really important to be aware that there very well could be other kinds of process related hazards that you all might need to consider for your particular foods that you're sourcing from your suppliers and your manufacturing settings. So don't take this list as the be all and end all. It's certainly a great starting place and, and I think um, should all be considered, but you do need to think more broadly and think about what else there might be within your own hands as well. So really, um, once we think about what this guidance entails is the reliance on just systematically applying this information in the whole hazard identification process. Um, I'd suggest perhaps starting at the supplier level and in identifying those inherent hazards in these ingredients. Appendix one tables can be a great place to start and then identifying these potential process related and facility related hazards that might uh, exist in your suppliers facilities. And we went through those related to various biological, chemical and physical kinds of hazards. And then moving to your own manufacturing level, um, using a step-by-step -step approach of your process to identify those, again, process related hazards and facility related hazards in those um, at least starting lists of biological, chemical, and physical hazards that the guidance outlines, but thinking broadly as well. So that's in the hazard identification category. The next step of hazard analysis is evaluation, considering the severity of those hazards and the likelihood of occurrence. Chapters two and three in the guidance can be very, very helpful here. And just a couple things to highlight. Um, when we think about evaluating the severity, uh, for example, in chapter 2.4.2.1, if you wanna get real specific, um, it talks about um, these factors to consider, such as the susceptibility, of your intended consumers, um, the magnitude and duration of the illness or injury, um, how long might it occur, is there potential for hospitalization, and then what is the impact of secondary problems or those um, known as chronic sequelae that may occur for an extended time period can all go in to help you in evaluating the severity of those hazards. Again, more and more parts um, from chapter two helps you at least start thinking about the likelihood of these hazards, including things like uh, how often there's been an association of the hazard with the food or a facility, 
how effective those facility programs are, uh, considering things like GMPs, how the uh, particular food item may be prepared or processed, what transportation is like, how the food is stored, and then what the consumer would do as far as preparing and handling that particular food item can all um, help you in evaluating what is the likelihood of that food safety hazard. Um, all of these are likely to vary among your facilities and within your products, so there really needs to be, be a very concerted effort of applying this information to your particular situation. So that, in a nutshell, is where we um, kind of have netted out as far as what this revised guidance tells us. Now, um, obviously, for those hazards that are identified to be potential, um, after going through hazard analysis, the next step would be identify the appropriate preventive controls for those hazards. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's the subject of another another day. And um, I would suggest if if you all need assistance with that, um, reaching out is certainly an action. Um, or some of this could come up in questions, I suppose. But really what the intention of our discussion today was to really focus in and uh, remind you with a capital R that this hazard analysis is such a key step to assuring food safety. And the FDA is expecting that we all do this very robustly, um, that we're not missing hazards, we're considering very broadly where these hazards might originate, whether it's from the particular ingredients, um, the processes both at the supplier as well as at the manufacturing facilities. And this guidance um, that has been released and continues to be updated, so keep looking for new updates, will really help you uh, in doing this hazard analysis properly. So I strongly urge you to become very, very familiar with this. I hope this has been uh, helpful for you all and to give you at least a flavor of what we see in the guidance. And I would be happy at this point to address questions um, as they may have come in. You know, it's it's funny because as looking at the questions that are coming in, they, they are kind of focusing around certain specifics around some of the examples that you gave. But I think if I'm gonna roll some of this up, when you were sharing the examples of uh, the table one, table two, to help identify the known or foreseeably potential hazards. Uh, one question that came in was around, I think you actually mentioned this, that it doesn't address heavy metals. So one question that came in here from Alicia was, how do we consider hazards such as heavy metals if there are no regulations regarding tolerances for heavy metals allowed in food products? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a definitive answer per se, but if we think about um, the information um, as far as what the tables tell us as a starting point, um, we start there, but then very much relying on expert advice from the literature, uh, from other um, consultants and, and groups out there who have done work related to heavy metals. Um, I understand that this is a challenging category to think about. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more concrete example, but being aware of the expert information that's out there and digging into um, valid information is gonna be at least the way I would approach this. And uh, sorry, th this is my question here, but I uh, did you say earlier when you were showing the tables that it used to include heavy metals on there, or well, did I get that wrong? From from my recollection, um, generally heavy metals were called out as a a base category called heavy metals. Um, ah. The newer tables have specifically related to arsenic, cadmium, and lead as types of heavy metals that need to be uh, considered or recommended to be considered within certain types of food um, commodities related to their presence, their association with these kinds of um, foods, et cetera. Okay, 
thank you. Now, um, a, a just, lot of and focus. Sorry, if I could add one more thing, and that's based on just um, our learning more about these kinds of substances. Um, I think that's a good way to think about um, learning evolves and research evolves. So staying up to date on the most current scientific information, um, back to kind of what I was saying earlier, keeping yourself informed about the latest uh, information is going to be really key. And that's an example that has been applied uh, through this newly released guidance. Mm. Um, sticking with the, the table topic, I guess we can say, or the known or foreseeable potential hazard tables, uh, does it take considerations into um, certain geographies or other environmental elements? And I know you just ended by saying there are other factors such as, you know, what what is the transportation like from a supplier or how does the consumer prepare food? But is are there other factors that are kind of underneath the the table that factors into what the table actually shows? Um, generally, yes, um, but I'll put yes in quotes. Um, there is a lot more information, like I say, added to Appendix 1 about some of these kinds of considerations. And um, I didn't show it, but under a lot of the tables, there's quite a list of footnotes mm -hmm. um, suggesting consideration of that example in particular, considering, you know, weather patterns, for example, related to mycotoxin proliferation. Um, right. You know, the from my perspective, that's nothing new in that we really need to be evaluating, say, the likelihood of a mycotoxin, using that as an example, um, in relation to where a particular grain might have been sourced from and what were the particular climate patterns that might impact the likelihood of a mycotoxin being there uh, at a level that, that needs a preventive control. Um, in addition to storage, transportation, those kinds of practices. So, you know, I think what the guidance has helped us do is to kind of put down in black and white some of those considerations that, again, should have been part of the thinking in the past but um, maybe wasn't completely fleshed out as well as, as it should have been. And I think these will give us a good starting place. Yeah, and, and you know, there's a theme here about suppliers and really knowing um, the conditions of, of, maybe it's the growing conditions or environmental conditions. Uh, as you said earlier, again, you know, what, what types of containers do they put it in? How do they transport it? Uh, you know, the temperature of the trucks as the, the product is getting to your facility, that sort of thing. So it's, it is not a one-size-fits-all um, guidance here. You have to do a little digging and, and really understand who you're doing business with. Um, I, I, got, I just got a question here from Valeria, who um, works in Argentina, and they are complying with the Argentinian food safety regulations as well as the U.S. regulations. And Valeria just wants to confirm that that is the appropriate thing to do to make sure that they are definitely um, complying with the U.S. regulations in order to do business with U.S.-based companies. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're if you're selling food in the U.S., you need to comply with the regulations here. Definitely. Now, um, you had mentioned allergens or incorrect labeling or allergens by cross contacts. Is is this one of those uh, common occurrences, would you say, when it comes to chemical hazards? Yeah, I, I mean, if we just think about um, the, you know, majority of recalls are related to allergen issues in general. And the way the guidance has laid this out, and by the way, the, the chapter in the guidance related to allergens was finalized sometime last fall and called out in particular um, issues related to labels in, in that the, the labels just had the incorrect information or that they weren't put on the right package appropriately. Mm -hmm. And then um, from a unintended allergen presence um, related to cross contact, um, yeah, those 
it, when there's been an evaluation of the reasons for issues with uh, allergens and the need for recalls, it generally falls into these two buckets, issues with labeling and issues with um, cross-contact leading to unintended allergen presence. I guess uh, just broadening it out, would you say that that is more prevalent than, say, some of the biological or physical hazards? Um, as a category, if we look at the reportable food registry or RFR categories, um, re issues related to allergens do top the list. Um, and if I'm remembering my my numbers right, um, salmonella and some of the other biological hazards separated out uh, specifically um, are below um, allergens. But if we um, added all of those biological uh, reasons for recalls together, um, they would be pretty close to where allergens are. It's just typically we think of them um, separately related to the types of um, biological hazards. That makes sense. Well, Lydia just came in with a really good one here. If a harmful containment is discovered in a finished product for which no tolerance has been established, would the FDA have the ability to consider the product adulterated under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act? So if a harmful um, containment is discovered in a finished product, would it be considered? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's something that is believed or known to cause harm, it shouldn't be in a food product mm -hmm. at any level. Yeah, and then uh, you had mentioned at the top that this this is not necessarily enforceable. It's more rec recommendation or guidance. Um, but do you do you think Adam just started asking the question here? But do you do you think the FDA is going to be um, making this part of the audit process? Are they going to be um, kind of bringing this up as a more uh, focal point during inspections? You know, I think time will tell. Um, the the guidance has obviously been out there now for around a month. Um, FDA and the FDA did a webinar related to this very topic just yesterday, and in that they described um, how they are acquainting their investigators with this guidance, and it's you know making sure that they're fully aware of of what's laid out here. Um, also, though, stressing to them that this is guidance. Um, you know, and not regulation. So, you know, how a particular investigator might apply this when they are coming into a facility obviously is is going to be dependent on them. But it was stressed in the webinar yesterday that um, they will be using this, um, you know, as as a starting place, but really looking to the industry and the firm they are particularly going into um you know with an open mind to to see what that firm has identified as well and then evaluating that um for accuracy ag against the kinds of criteria that are spelled out in the guidance so um you know i think it's in everybody's best interest to make sure that you're you know you're following this because it's it's good science if nothing else right Right, and especially if we're all believers in in good food safety practices. So, um, one one thing I'd say, and this this seems to come up as we do these Fismo Fridays, but documentation is is kind of the the best way for you to make sure that you are following your own um, processes. And obviously, if this ever does become somewhat of a requirement, you'll have that to sort of show proof that you're following through with these recommendations. And, um, you know, when, when it comes to documentation, sometimes this is one of the harder things uh, for, for people to do. It takes time. Uh, sometimes it's done, you know, paper and pen. It, you know, you got to go through a bunch of paperwork. Do you have any recommendations around like a process at which somebody can uh, put together that allows them to make sure that they are looking at these these new updated rules or require, not requirements, I'm sorry, but recommendations and uh, keep keep a more methodical approach to maintaining good best practice? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's incumbent on the industry if, you know, we're producing food, we need to stay up to date on on what what's out there. 
Um, and this includes you know, being aware of, of scientific and technical developments, as well as information you know, like this guidance. The, the, so I, there's not really a way to shortcut it too much. Um, and just looking through it and make and becoming familiar with what's here. Um, you know, I will say, although there's been a lot of interest in this guidance, understandably, because the Appendix 1 information is um, has been revised, you know, the process of using that information has really stayed the same. Um, you know, and I think, as I described, being very systematic and making sure that ingredients have been fully evaluated to determine what hazards might be identified in those ingredients, and then considering how those ingredients are being used within your own facility. What, what are you doing to those ingredients when you make them into your food products, and how um, might you be lessening or increasing one of these hazards through that process. Likewise, you know, how has the supplier uh, handled that ingredient and how have they increased or lessened the potential hazards that might be with those ingredients? So I think just being very systematic and ensuring that, you know, the ingredients from A to Z within your particular facility have been considered. Um, some of which you know you may be able to kind of go quickly through because there truly is no identified hazard with some ingredients then you can move on to those that may have an identified hazards and then think really hard about well how is this being used um, how has it again been processed transported held exposed to the environment um, liable for cross contact all of those kinds of things Kind of asking those questions about each ingredient and then you know considering its use is is really the way to do it it's it's not an easy process it is time consuming and i think to me this is what uh, the guidance continues to emphasize that we need to to do this very methodically to make sure that these hazards are being identified evaluated and then where needed that we've got the right preventive controls in place yeah it's like doing an audit on all of your ingredients and mapping it to the known hazards and the processes in which you're handling ingredients and transporting them so yeah yeah it's, so it, it, it you know that this is not a process to shortcut at all um you know the hazard analysis is really the crux of your food safety plan and it needs to be thought of that way. Well, Ruth, that's a great, great point to end on here. And I really appreciate it because again, this is one of those things that probably is still gonna evolve. And um, as, as I, I've seen some questions come through, yes, again, this is a recorded webinar, so we'll send the recording out along with the slides. So you'll have probably some more questions after you review that with your team. Um, but uh, Ruth and the tag team are available to answer any and all of your food safety related questions. If you head on over to their website, atchisongroup.com, or you can email there on the uh, email address that you see there on the screen, uh, they'll be happy to talk to you about it and find out a little bit more about what your situation is. You can also head on over to safetychain.com. We have a bunch of resources that we have created in partnership with the Atchison Group as well to make sure that you're following good food safety practices. And of course, we have FISMA Friday every last Friday of the month. So we look forward to seeing you on the next time. And Dr. Ruth, we really appreciate you coming on again. This is amazing. And uh, we'd love to have you again soon. So thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend ahead and we'll look to forward to seeing you soon. Take care now. Thank you. Bye-bye.